Hi, and welcome to Classical Stuff You Should Know, a podcast about literature and philosophy and old things from guys who like it. My name is Graham Donaldson, and I am joined, as always, with Mr. Thomas Megby. Hello. And Arthur Jan Hannenberg. This guy right here. And today, if I read the show notes correctly, or asked when I asked AJ what we were doing, it sounds like we're doing happy hour? We're doing happy hour right um, now. So happy hour sounds great. Yeah, that'd be nice. Uh, I don't know. I mean, man, what do early. I want? What would I want for happy hour? I, I kind of... Like, what's where you have that thing, you crush it, and it's got te- te- tequila in it, and it's mm-hmm. like you put salt on the rim. What's that called there, uh, Hamburg? Bloody Mary? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Ugh. Close. We're talking about Scotland today. Nope. Oh. Uh, we're talking about a book called The Master and Margarita. Oh, wow. Sounds delicious. Margaritas do sound good. Well, I, we should be drinking margaritas for this. I don't think alcohol in podcasting is a good idea at all. Didn't we talk? We've talked about this. I heartily disagree. Oh. But... <laughs> But we can we can have that chat another, <laughs> I feel like another, another time. time. Maybe yeah. on an AMA we can do that. Uh, yeah, I feel like that's much more fun. Can we please have the argument with one of us having had had a few and the other oh one word. not? That could be like the top tier. Is <laughs> we do an AMA, but after like five or six margaritas. Oh gosh, oh, that's a bad idea. Sounds that miserable. wouldn't be good. Five or six, I'd be like asleep. <laughs> so it's just three of us snoring for an hour. I'd be, yeah, I can I'd hand- be singing. I can handle like one or two. Like Piano Man by Billy Joel. You do that in the podcast already. That's actually true. This isn't coffee. <laughs> <laughs> no, <I'm just> <laughs> oh, man. Graham's been full of it today. It's yes, been great. Yeah. It's been a good day. Okay. So we are discussing The Master and Margarita, which is a novel written in Russian by a Russian oh. named Mikhail Bulgakov. And I know I'm probably mi- mispronouncing that name, but There's no way. You know, we're yeah. doing what we got to do. And it was written between 1928 and 1940 and during Stalin's regime. Now, I don't know a lot about Stalin's regime, and I tried to do a little bit of investigating while I prepared for this podcast, but turns out that's a pretty big chunk of history. Yeah. Uh, it's just, it is rough to, to catch, you know, to, to wrap my head around and right. summarize. So I'm going to put that responsibility on Graham. Oh, Graham, what can you tell us about Stalin and his regime? Um, Stalin or otherwise affectionately known as so-so by the Russian people. Sure. Um, I mean, he took power from... So the, you have the communist revolution, the Bolsheviks, they kill everybody, all the former inter- important people, um, the Tsar, his kids, except maybe Anastasia, maybe escaped to Chicago, maybe. Wait, the Bolsheviks are... That's Stalin's group? No, not at the beginning. Stalin is like... The Bolsheviks had their own leaders... Um, and I, again, I'm not a huge scholar on Stalin's biography, but at some point he rises through the ranks and assumes sort of power of the communist party and is the de facto dictator of Russia. But on paper, it's still, you know, like the people's party. It's communist. But but in, in, in actuality, he ends up becoming the only man in charge and then his word is law and he has multiple purges where he purges out sort of the old people from, like the, by old people I mean the, the original, the OG <laughs> Bolsheviks. Um, um, there's that famous picture of him, he's like airbrushed out. Who is it? Is it of, not Lenin, it's um, um, I I, Trotsky? I don't remember. Anyway, there's, he has, so there's like a photograph of him next to this like other famous Bolshevik, but then he actually has the official picture like, doctored so it's just him standing there and the guy's gone <laughs> um but so he assumes power he uh um nikolai yetsov oh yeah okay he right. also purged the kulaks oh man he so yes he was which vi- were the like peasants that owned more than eight acres of land yeah so they did he was sort of in charge of doing all these great reorganizations uh all of these purges uh was not very good to uh like ukraine uh was not very and um um and yeah as time went on, um, became kind of um, like a crazy person, uh, very conspiratorial. Um, there are some pretty cool legends about like his final, his like dying last words or apparently he, he's been like a coma for a little bit and hasn't moved. And then the last thing he does is he sits up and he shakes his fist at God and dies. That's the story that goes. Oh, that's metal. I know. Um, but he, uh, um, yeah, he became uh, the... Uh, basically the almost like the god king of Russia um, from 
born out of this sort of big power vacuum, um, got them through World War II, where, you know, in Russia, um, uh, they probably rightly very much see them as the defeaters of Nazi Germany, whereas in the U.S. we see us as the defeaters of Nazi Germany, but they took the full brunt, or the pretty big brunt. If you look at the death tolls, it's insane. Yep. Russia lost something um, like 5x what we lost. So, you know, he, like that. he 20X, was sort remember. of coming to power uh, and was sort of the man while that happened. And because he did that, it solidified power for the rest of his life. But uh, a brutal person uh, opened up the gulags, the death camps. Um, displaced. So what's a, what's a gulag? What's that all about? Um, it's basically like a work camp. Um, uh, and think of it as a, as a big prison that you can kind of, instead of having it be like a prison because you had a sentence, it can be uh, something that the state has said you need to go do for the health of the state. Be like, hey, you know what? You've been chosen to go cut some rocks in this camp um, to help, you know, uh, help the state achieve its goals. And um, so, yeah, communist Russia was a very, uh, they had these sort of ambitious five-year plans of completely reorganizing They would call it modernizing their peasantry ways into like a modern economy, but it meant massive displacements of people, complete destruction of like ancestral farmland, um, uh, moving whole groups of people from like one end of the country to the other, plopping them in. It caused all sorts of problems. There's great, you know, all these stories of people in like Kazakhstan that even to this day, there's been these sort of displaced peoples that move from one side of Russia to other sides of Russia that have, yeah. Anyway, he, he was, his word was law, and he kind of rose to power in the great um, sort of troubles of uh, the existential threat of Nazi Germany. Um, okay. I mean, he, he was coming through the ranks, and uh, you know, the, the revolution sure. started in 1917, and I don't know the official date when he was considered the, the, you know, the first among equals, or however you want to call it. That's the Pope. Um, whoops. <laughs> First among um, equals. That, that doesn't that, make sense. Um, uh, or he, when he became sort of like came the head power. of the... Hmm? What you're saying, when he came to yeah, power. Yeah, I, I don't know what day he would have come to power. But okay. um, so, you know, his people, when they... People who like communism will always point to Stalin as like the guy that stopped communism from fully happening because he just sort of turned Russia into a dictatorship. Um, I, ca- I tend to think that dictatorship is sort of the end game of communism anyway. Um, but anyway, that's, okay. that's all I know. All right. So a couple things that I can add the, during the, you know, s- slight bits of research that I did. Part of the reason that he w- was doing what he was doing is to modernize, right? Yes. He, they had gotten behind all the other industrialized nations and they needed to industrialize to sort of keep up with all of the westernized nations who were cranking out products. And he's like, this has to happen. So big upheaval, was communist, and generally, the theory is that in communism, the government should get less and less and less as the people have more and more control. He said, yes, that's true, but first it must become stronger. <laughs> and so, like, the government is becoming stronger under his theory that it yeah. needs to become strong enough to run everything, and then eventually it will become less, but, of course, a man in power doesn't really want to give up all that. And while he's in charge, yep, people are disappearing, they're being sent to the gulags, there's, you know papers that you have to have, all this identification stuff, and sort of reporting, like people reporting on each other. Um, There were also big housing shortages, which will come up in the Master Margarita. You know, an apartment was a pretty hot commodity, and they, a lot of people would live in the same apartment space and just have little cordoned off sections. So there were a lot of things going on. Some of that will come up in Master Margarita, just, you know, from reading the novel, I sort of put together what it was like in Russia at the time. Mm -hmm. But yeah, big autocrat, Gulags, not not a shiny time necessarily to be a Russian. I will. So the one story that I always think of with Stalin that helps sort of solidify his character is he was describing to some of his ministers how to have control over people, and what he did is he brought in a chicken into the um, you know the room where he was, and the chicken was kind of running around, kind of a scared chicken because it was in this place with all these people. He picked it up by the neck and plucked it live ripped out every single feather. The chicken is screaming its head off and writhing in pain. He plucks the entire chicken completely naked, puts it on the ground. The chicken is absolutely traumatized, doesn't know what to do, doesn't know where to run, is just sort of this traumatized chicken. He take, he puts it in his, head in his pocket, takes out some chicken feed, holds it in his hand. The chicken comes and eats out of his hand, and he says, that's how you control people. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. 
Not great. That is intense. Yeah. So that's that's sort of the parody. Whenever I think of Stalin, that's the story I think of. No kidding. And so that kind of describes the the kind of person that he was. You ever think about doing that in the first day of class? <laughs> <laughs> Watch this, students. <laughs> this is how I will control you. <laughs> Prepare to read Frankenstein. <laughs> All right. So let's talk about the author a little bit, and I promise then we will get to the plot. And then at the end, I'm just trying to put together the symbolism. So I'll have a bunch of things that I'm wondering about why they were the way they were in the book, and you guys can help me figure out why the wor- they were the way they were. Let's do it. Right? Because there's a lot of different interpretations for it. So, Bulgakov, he was one of seven children, the oldest of three brothers. His dad was a state counselor, a professor at Kiev Theological Academy, and a prominent Orthodox essayist and a translator of religious texts. So, really into God, right? Sure. Both grandfathers were clergymen, so he grew up in a very religious household, which was kind of unfortunate because yeah. Stalin, was he was he big on Christianity no, or Orthodoxy, they executed, would you say? They executed every priest they could find. Yeah. So not real big on Christianity stuff. It was definitely not in vogue during his, his reign. Uh, he was born in Bryansk, Russia, uh, and then he moved to Kiev to study. He was drawn to the theater and used to write comedies and plays at home, which his sisters and brothers would act out just for kicks. Um, after going to the first Kiev gymnasium where he got into Russian and European literature, his dad died and his mom assumed responsibility for his education. And then he entered into the medical faculty of Kiev University and finished with a special commendation. So the dude was a doctor right. most of the time. During the First World War, he volunteered with the Red Cross, went straight to the front, got injured twice, and got addicted to morphine, which he, an addiction he would eventually kick and then write a book about it. Hmm. So that's kind of fun. If you ever want to read about a morphine addiction, you can. Then there's basically a long chunk of his life where he was just doing doctor stuff, right? Going different places, doing doctory things, and I'm going to kind of gloss over it because we got other things to talk about. Can we pause for a second? How did he kick it? Like, does he talk about, like, did he just pull turkey or did he, like, lock himself in a room? I have Hmm. no idea. Interesting. Right? It would be yeah. fun to read about. I don't know. Would, um, it, would it be? That would be fun to be read about? I don't know. It's, it's interesting. It would be interesting. Yeah, it would be interesting, yes. I find interesting things fun. Good. Okay. Uh, he lived through a civil war and witnessed 10 different coups, which is fun. Which civil war? I mean, I'd, were the Russian one? Like, yeah, I would assume. Yeah. Yep. The revolution. Um, in 1919, he was mobilized as an army physician by the Ukrainian People's Army and assigned to the Northern Caucasus. There he got typhus and barely survived. Um, And while he was there, he started working as a journalist. He was eventually called to return to France and Germany, but he was denied permission to leave Russia because of the typhus. And his family kind of went without him. They emigrated to Paris. Most of his family did. Um, So he had a complicated relationship with Stalin. Stalin knew him personally, Hmm. or at least knew his work, right? He was a pretty prominent playwright. And Stalinist, Stalin had personally banned a couple of his plays. Like said, this play is not okay. We cannot perform this. It is, you know, not all right and not allowed to do it. But he really enjoyed a lot of his work. And he protected him from both arrest and execution, but couldn't necessarily get all of his stuff, you know, published, right? But he saw some of his plays and enjoyed them personally. There was one called The White Guard that supposedly Stalin saw at least 15 times. The public generally liked his stuff, but the critics would occasionally give him really bad reviews and pan his stuff pretty heavily. Um, And then by March 1929, the government had censored publication of any of his work, right? He just wasn't allowed to publish any of his stuff, was not all right. So he decided to write Stalin a letter. And he said, Dear Mr. Stalin, If I can't write, can you at least let me leave? Like, I would like to go somewhere else. If you can't find use for me as a writer, I would like to go somewhere else that that can find a use for me. And Stalin called him directly and asked if he really wanted to leave his homeland. And Bulgakov said that a Russian writer cannot live outside of his homeland, and he generally wanted to stay. So Stalin gave him permission to continue working at the art theater, one Mm -hmm. place. Um, During this, this kind of period, he married a lady... It's his third marriage, Yelena Shilvskaya, who is kind of, I mentioned her because she is the art, the source for Margarita, right? He kind of made Margarita his, one of his main characters in this book after his third wife. And he continued working on his masterpiece through, you know, most of the late period of his life, which is the master and Margarita. Uh, he, he gave a reading of this book in 1939 to his closest friends and his wife remembers 30 years later that when he finished reading 
He said, tomorrow I'm going to take the novel to the publisher, and everyone was silent because everything in the novel scared them. They were afraid that he was going to get in trouble for it and that it would cause terrible things to, to come. So, he, so they knew it would, it would rain down on him. It's a satire, yeah, yeah. and it's a satire about Stalinist Russia. Ooh, and gross. so he would, yeah, basically horrible, horrible things, and he didn't publish it during his life, right? I think I said it was published in 1967, far, mm. far posthumously. He died in 1940 of a kidney disorder. Hmm. So this is a book that was not published during the regime, but did come out way later. And so, well, but I mean, obviously, 19, we say 67, like you're still in communist Russia. So did someone yeah, 1967 smuggle it in out? Paris. Or, oh, so someone got it out somehow? Yeah. Cool. You said his family was in Paris, right? Yeah. They must have found a way to get it there. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. So let's, let's talk about the book. I, I can say that if you are a person who is just jumping into the classics and you're wondering what it would be fun to read, this one's a hoot. It's super fun. It's really enjoyable all the way through. And <laughs> Love that satire of Russia, communist Russia. Ah, it's good though, man. It's a, it's a pretty fun little romp of a play. And, <laughs> or not a play, a novel. And I didn't really know what I was getting into. I started reading it and, man, it's fun. Cool. It's just fun. So I'm going to, let's, let's talk about the plot. So here's, here's what the, the satire begins as. So these two guys, Berlioz and a poet named Homeless. <laughs> right? That's okay. well, this is his nickname, oh, right? Okay. He, he has a real Russian name, but everybody calls him Homeless because okay. he's a poet and he's doing things and he's out there writing. And Berlioz is, he publishes a newspaper or an art magazine and he's trying to convince this poet to do a better job of making Jesus look stupid. And he's saying, you make him too lifelike. We're trying to convince the public that he's not real. And he's like, that's what I did in my poem. And he's like, yes, but he's kind of likable and we can't have him be likable. And so we need to make him worse. And they're having this conversation about how Jesus doesn't exist. And this guy kind of pops up out of nowhere. And his name, he sits down and he says, I'm named Woland. And he is a foreigner, although they can't really place his accent. And he's got a green eye and a black eye. And he has a little cane that has a little poodle head on it. And he's, you know, dressed kind of strangely. Right. And they start talking with him and he's, he starts remembering some stuff that happened with Pontius Pilate. And they're like, well, were you there? And he's like, well, kind of. And he, he during this conversation where they're talk, talking about how Jesus doesn't exist, this guy, Woland, who clearly actually is the devil, hmm. talks with them. And he says, well, I can actually tell Berlioz you when you are going to die. Um, it's going to be a woman and she's going to, she's going to kill you later, right? Because of the oil, the oil has already slipped and he kind of makes these weird allusions to it and they just kind of blow him off and they think he's kind of nuts right. and then they're going to call the cops on him. And so that they try to, and he sort of, you know, just sort of runs off and Berlioz leaves that night and does get killed, oh. right? He gets run over by a tram and what had happened was he slipped on some oil that a lady had spilled on the way home from the grocery store, slips under this tram car that was piloted by a woman, Right. And so all of his little foretellings come true. And the poet homeless goes nuts. He's right. like, clearly this guy's a wizard. So he tries to chase down this Woolen guy who's in the company of two people. One, a guy in checkered pants with a cracked set of glasses, a pince nez, and a really big black cat that walks on its hind legs. And he tries to track them all down, but he can't seem to catch them. And he can't seem to get him. And he follows the cat and the cat gets on a tram car, like pays his money and then rides off. And then he, no matter how fast he runs, these guys always seem to outrun him and he loses them. He loses these guys. And he is, you know, through, through various misadventures, he loses his clothes, he loses everything he's got. And then he ends up at a restaurant howling, like in his underpants, holding a candle about trying to find the devil. And they're like, well, he's gone bananas. So they take this homeless guy and they put him in an insane asylum where he continues to try to convince people that he saw a foreigner who predicted someone's death and might be the devil. Okay. All right, so that's how the novel begins, right? right? Okay. And so Woland with his... Sounds with like a hoot. His, so far, it's real fun. Woland with his buddies... This, no, the devil. With the devil, mm -hmm. yeah, Woland. Um, sets, sets up in the dead guy's apartment. So Berlioz has a... He's got a housemate, and the devil goes there, and he's like, oh, how's it going? And starts chatting with him. He's like, why are you in my house? And he's like, well, didn't you, don't you remember? I'm a black magician. We've talked about setting up a little review in your variety theater... And we, we've done all this. Look, here's the, here's the contract. You must have been drunk. And the guy's like, oh, okay, sweet. So he tries to figure out what's going on, and they decide to send him to another country. They just snap their fingers, and he wakes up somewhere completely else, and then they just take over the apartment. So Berlioz is dead. His 
housemate is gone, and the devil decides to set up a variety show or a, a de- demonstration of black magic and then an expose of the black magic okay. at a theater in Moscow. So that's what the devil is here to do, okay. is set up this thing. So he does. And he's kind of a hooligan. He makes money rain from the sky. Everyone goes nuts and grabs all the money. And then he sets up a ladies' shop on stage where ladies can come up and just get free shoes and purses and dresses and whatever. And he just calls them up on stage and they start doing it. And then there's a mad rush for the stage and they all get all fancied up and then go sit down. He gets annoyed with the announcer and tears his head off um, and then tells him to go walk off. And the guy sort of like grabs his head and then hobbles off the stage. And like all this, all this crazy black magic. And then he, Woland sort of disappears and the black cat continues to administer all the things to the crowd and then the show's over and the crowd leaves. Well, turns out all that stuff was magical and the clothes disappear (laughs) and the money becomes like ripped up paper bills and labels for soda cans and that sort of thing. And so all of a sudden you have, you know, a hundred people in the middle of downtown Russia with no clothes on. And so they have to all run home and it's this huge scandal. And basically Woland sows chaos wherever he goes right? He threatens the people who run the variety show. At one point, this guy's like, devil take me. And all of a sudden, one of the guys shows up and says, that can be arranged and takes the man away and then has a suit replace him, an animated suit that is doing his job. And in random places, people will begin singing and not be able to stop. And so he's just generally a curse to everyone involved, right? So that's what Woland is there to do. He's he's there just kind of so in chaos. Um, We find out later that what the devil wanted to do was see the people in Russia, right? Get to know the people of Moscow. And the easiest way for him to do that was to bring them all to a, to a theater yeah, and right. sort of watch what they do. And the exposure of the black arts was kind of him exposing them for what they are, right? Greedy people that are, you know, will fight themselves to get on stage and take purses and take whatever they can get their hands on and be greedy, right? Okay, so fade to back with homeless, Right, you guys remember Homeless? Yes. Oh, he's in a crazy, oh, crazy house. So Homeless is in a crazy house, and he meets this fella who lives in the next room and climbs over the balcony named The Master. And The Master is sort of a disheveled-looking character who eventually tells his story. And what happened with The Master is that he was writing a story about Pontius Pilate, right? And he came out with this beautiful novel, and he sent some chapters to his publisher, and some critics got a hold of it, and they universally panned it. Right. They just shot it down. They said he was, you know, championing biblical stuff and he was all about all about religion and they couldn't be having that in this new regime. And so he, they basically tanked his book before it ever got off the ground. And it was an excellent book. And he had been in a relationship with a woman named Margarita, who was beautiful. They were both married to mm-hmm. different people oh, oh. and having sort of a secret life in a little basement apartment together. But it was the best time of their lives. And he, because his book sort of got sent down the toilet, started to sort of, you know, lose his marbles and he got nervous and then despondent and depressed. And eventually she left one night to go be honest with her husband so that she could stay with him and kind of nurse him back to health. And while she was gone that night, he ran off and went and went to the insane asylum, asked for help. That's where he's been ever since. And he hasn't told her where he is. And she is just torn up about the whole the whole thing. So interspersed with the chapters, as you read along in this book, you're getting little chapters of the Pontius Pilate book. Okay. Oh, cool. Right? So it will go back and you'll see Pontius Pilate and he talks with Yeshua, right? Jesus. And he's brought up and it's, it definitely departs, departs from scripture a little bit. There's really only one disciple, Matthew Levi. And he's got an antsy character. Uh, Jesus himself says that he hasn't done any miracles and he doesn't know why these people are deciding to execute him. And it's all just a bad deal. Um, but he does. He like you, you follow through and you go through the whole execution and it follows all of the intrigues that happen with Judas and you kind of get this story as it goes through. It's a wonderful little story, even if it's not biblically accurate, but you get it sort of interspersed with the other chapters. Mm -hmm. So he tells this story and interspersed with, you know, Woland generally making mayhem in Moscow. Eventually in part two, we get to meet Margarita, right? This woman that the master Mm -hmm. was shacked up with. You guys following so far? Mm -hmm. All right. So Margarita is having a bad time, does not like her husband, misses the master, and is generally feeling pretty, pretty garbagey. And one day on a bench, she says, oh, I would sell my soul to the devil to know where he is, to just know if he's alive, the master. And of course, one of the entourage of Satan shows up. This is a new character I haven't talked about, but his name is Azazello. So okay. the characters, you've got Koroviev. He's the guy in the checkered pants with the pince-nez. You've got Behemoth, 
the cat, who is essentially the jester to the devil's king. Okay. Right? He just he makes big speeches and he's kind of a goof and he does silly things and he can turn from a cat into a person and back again. And you've got Hella, their their waitress, their kind of like housekeeper that never wears clothes and is probably a succubus. And you've got this last guy, Azazello, who looks like a tiny pirate, has red hair, one eye, and a big fang. Okay. So this guy, red hair, red hair, one eye, big fang, shows up on the bench and he's like, oh, we can arrange the selling of your soul. The devil has requested you. And she sort of writes him off at first and then he continues to convince her and she basically says, yes, I will do his bidding, right? Take me to him. This sounds great. And so he gives her this little canister of solve, like uh, like lotion, uh-huh. right? And he says, put it all over yourself and then be at this place. So she takes it home. She waits for the appointed time, puts it all over and instantly becomes a witch and knows that she's a witch. She's like, I'm a witch. Okay. And her demeanor changes a little bit, right? She becomes more hungry and violent and savage and she takes off all her clothes and then can, can command broomsticks and gets instantly lighter and flies off. Okay. And she kind of flies around and really enjoys her time. And then her housekeeper also gets a hold of the salve and puts it on and becomes a witch and then decides to turn the, the downstairs neighbor into a hog. And she <laughs> rides the hog instead of a broomstick. And she's like, I want to stay a witch. So that's funny. Satan lets her like that girl gets to stay a witch. And Margarita finds one of the houses of one of the critics who panned the master's book and absolutely trashes the place, breaks all the windows and turns on all the faucets and stops up all the tubs and floods the place. And then eventually goes and finds Woland. And this is where it gets weirder than than it has been. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) So it gets a little bit weirder in that she, for some reason, is going to be the queen at his ball. And he has like a midnight ball. It's a spring full moon. And she has to sit at the top of a staircase for a really long time greeting guests. And they all come out of this big Sounds like fireplace. Hell. Yeah, they come out of a big fireplace and they like skeletons tumble out and then go bloop into people and then come up and greet her. And she has to say hello to all these people. And it's a big, crazy party. Um, and she is essentially queen for the night. And in return, she can ask for something and she asks for the master back. Mm-hmm. Right. I feel like. Let's see. Can I ask my questions without giving any more? I'm not sure I want to spoil the whole, whole book for our listeners. Um, Why not? Yeah. I'm gonna. I want to know what happens. Okay, so he asks for, she asks for the master back, right? And Satan gives it. He says, okay, I got you. So he blips the master into the room, and he sets them up in that little basement apartment that they had been in before. They wanted everything to be the same, and he plunks them down there, no harm, no foul. The guy who, you can never go back. The guy who was living there was one of the critics that had panned the book <laughs> because the reason why he did that is because he wanted the apartment. That's like funny. he wanted some place to live that was a little bit better than where he was. Right. That's funny. And so he complains about having to have whitewashed the place as he's sort of being sent away. And he, Woland installs them there, right? After that, the time has sort of come for Woland to leave. And as a storm rolls in, Matthew Levi visits right? The single disciple of Christ shows up in Moscow. No, he's not just in the book. Not just in the book. And he essentially says, what up, Satan? I hate you. You're the worst. But uh, Jesus has an errand for you. And you are supposed to go and give the master and Margarita peace. And he's like, light? You know, what what do I got to bring him to the light? And he's like, I didn't say light. Peace. They don't deserve the light. They deserve peace. And they have kind of a weird conversation about light and shadow that I'll come back to. But Azazello shows up in their little basement apartment and says, I've got some great wine for you. It's the same stuff that... Is that the pants? It's the... Nope, not checkered pants. It's Yellowfang. Mm. Yellowfang shows up. Pirate. Yep. yep. Says, I've got some wine for you. It's the same wine that Pontius Pilate drank. And here, have it. It's like a thousand years old. And so they drink it, and it was poison. And they oh. both die. And he's like, relax. And he kind of revives them with the same wine again. And they sort of realize that they're dead. And apparently... Weird stuff has been going on for a while because Margarita has a weird double that's been living in her apartment and that double dies. And the master has somebody living in the room where he had been spirited away from and that guy dies. And so it seems like the moment that they interacted with Satan, they were away from their normal selves. Okay. Does that make sense? Kind of. Like there were, there were versions of them that were still living where they used to be. Avatars. Yeah. Like little avatars. Sure. And then, Satan takes them and they begin to fly off. And as they fly into the moon, all of the pretense sort of falls off, right? So Margarita turns back away from a witch, right? She's died, so she's no longer a witch. So she's in her normal self again. She's not so wild and savage. And then we get to see the actual version of Satan, Azazel, Behemoth. And they're generally look look like 
nights, right? And one of them is kind of doing penance for a bad pun, he told. I can read you that se section. But this is his entourage. They're just a bunch of weird folks. And then eventually we find out that Margarita and the master get to sort of go into the afterlife in peace, right? Where they'll just sort of enjoy each other forever. And it doesn't seem like heaven, doesn't seem like hell. They also see Pontius Pilate, who is sitting and grieving on the same place that he has been since that night where he decided to kill Jesus, right? He's been having bad sleep. He suffers from migraines. And they're like, we can't, why can't we make him free, right? Margarita asks, please make him free. And Satan essentially says, he will be. It's coming. He's already accounted for, right? He's already done penance for the thing that he is doing. And eventually he will get to see the one for whom he yearns, right? He'll get to go back to Jesus. Mm -hmm. And basically a dream that he's been having for this whole thing, that he walks along a beam of light towards the moon, discussing, talking with Jesus is going to happen, right? He's going to walk along that beam of light with Jesus and return to, to light. And so Pontius Pilate will get off the hook. The master and Margarita are going to live a peaceful life and Wolin and everybody else just sort of disappear. Okay. And then the way that they explain everything that happened in Moscow, all the fires and burning and all the horrible things that Wolin did was it was hypnotists. <laughs> hypnotists did it all, folks. Hypnotists and ventriloquists because really they okay. have to explain the cat. And so one of the only fallouts was that people captured a whole bunch of black cats and brought them to the police. Turned out none of them were evil demons. And that was the fallout. So that's the story. Okay. Seems really weird. Yeah, it's weird. I'm waiting, so, for, I'm waiting for you to connect this to Russia. Like, okay, the way it connects is that it's a satire in that Woland is essentially stolen. Okay. Right. So he comes in, he sows chaos. He, and, and there's all kinds of other satire about people being disappeared for the government. Right. And there's all the, these intrigues of people reporting on each other and pe people getting in trouble for using other currency and everyone's nervous and jokes about living in the same space. And it's all just sort of a takedown of current life in Russia, showing what it's like to live there. And Woland being the guy who brings all of the craziness, but also exposes the people for what they are. Okay. Right. So that's, that's the first thing, right? Woland as Stalin. Um, he's also kind of, I think. It's probably not going to go down well. Yeah, probably, probably not. He's also, you know, trying to return to at least some semblance of Christianity, right? He, it's, it is a book about the divine and about why that's not necessarily a bad thing. So that's probably not going to survive well either. But there were some things I don't quite get. And maybe you guys can help me figure it out. Number one, why did Margarita get to be the queen of Satan's ball? She wasn't special. The only thing she'd said is that she would get to sell her soul to the devil. He said yes. She became a witch. But the thing is, every other attender at that ball was a poisoner or a, you know, someone that did treason or someone that had double dealt or everyone that attended that Walpurgis Night Ball was some sort of criminal, right? Some sort of devil, someone who had done something awful. Why was she the queen? She was an adulteress. Yeah, but... What's that have to do So with? everybody else. No, why is she the queen? Because she's cute. I was going to say that. Didn't you, didn't you say she was really pretty? She, well, not originally. She put the salve on and it made her beautiful. Oh. And then all the other women that attend the ball, also naked. Oh. But are they as beautiful as she is? Maybe, but I, I don't see why that qualifies her to, to a special place. Because she was willing to sell a soul? I don't know. She sold her soul for love. And that makes her better than everyone else. I don't know. Uh... I, Maybe you're onto something there. Because everyone else actually did something. I mean, she, this person's an adulterer, but um, yeah, I don't know. She sold her soul because she wanted to find out where her lover was. So that seems different than what the other people probably did. I don't know. Maybe. You got to have a queen in the ball. Maybe. Yeah, maybe Sage just wanted something, but everyone seems to greet her as though she has this special place, right? She has to greet everyone that comes through the door, and it gets so tiresome that she has to prop her arm up on a column to say hello, and they all kiss her knee, and her poor knee is falling to pieces, right? It's, it's weird, and then she has to make appearances to everybody else at the ball. It's, it's a strange moment. Right. So I don't understand that. Um, why, is the, why is the writer called the master? And as he left, he went to go talk to one guy, homeless, his disciple, and he called him my one disciple. And it sure, certainly seems like a mirror of the whole Jesus yeah. with the one disciple of Matthew Levi. I can't figure that one out. Don't really have that one. Um, well, hmm. you had, so in the book, the story of Jesus was a story about somebody that gets sort of caught up in this political moment that shouldn't have been caught up in this political moment. Like you said, Jesus didn't perform miracles. He's like, I don't know why I'm getting arrested. So it sounds like the master 
is writing Jesus as this um, either like artist or intellectual or somebody who is like pursuing his work and gets caught up in these earthly affairs and gets ground under the machine of like the state just like and then the master is in the same boat so he's sort of seeing he maybe he sees that as the as the christ archetype is like the the person who is above politics and is doing his sacred mission and then politics comes in and crushes him and so it's nothing to do with like saving mankind for their sins but it has to do with like being the the arch- the romantic archetype of like creativity or something i don't know like yeah i think that i think also maybe just a you know, self-portrait. Yeah. Right. Bulgakov wrote a bunch of stuff and got panned by the critics and kind of, th- again, thrown under the wheels of this great machinery to mean that his work was never recognized. Yeah. Or at least wouldn't be recognized for a long time. I'm wondering. So I'm wondering if he sees it as sort of a Jesus reflected in the master reflected in himself. That's a pretty high thing to say about yourself, I guess. Yes. Um, so the, and then, you know, so he's got the one disciple, the like, the person who can sort of recognize his genius in, in, even when everyone else is going to kill him for it, right? And so he sees that's what the disciples are and that's what homeless is. Okay. So it's the setting up Christ as the writer or as the, the artist as opposed to the, the divine savior of mankind. Checks out. Although I, I, he seems like a fellow that would have been religious. I, I'm, I find it... But that's my question. I don't, yeah. yeah. Just I don't the know, way that you tell the, the story makes it. me think that maybe he was... Not religious, but like was like loved the sort of like almost like the psychological symbols of the faith as opposed to like the actual faith. faith. Kind of like how um, Jordan Peterson uses like talks, Hmm. uses the stories of the Bible to talk about like psychological, what he thinks sees as like psychological truths. That's a pretty in vogue thing. Uh, And and I'm just wondering if that's if he sort of views Christ as the same way that 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 it's uh, the state is grinding up the the stories of old as opposed to like destroying this this the actual church maybe yeah, uh, he also does things like you know in scripture it talks about Judas Iscariot going into a field and sort of losing his guts or hanging himself mm-hmm. getting killed and in the story it's it's people that assassinate him yeah yeah right he is killed for what he has done and then the the money is taken so he's he's taking some poetic license with it for sure mm-hmm. Okay. I got nothing. It does seem like uh, some part of it has to be about the master's the one writing this excellent work. So, but he, he's not given that name by someone else, is he? He just introduces himself as the master. Yeah, he calls himself the master. I forget. I forget how he come by, came by the nickname. Yeah. But. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. It's weird. Um, the other weird thing to me is if this is supposed to be sort of a takedown of Woland or a takedown of Stalin, the strange thing is that Stalin and his entourage seem to be the ones having the most fun. (laughs) Everyone else is having a terrible time. Everyone is wanting for land and for money, and they're all sort of money-grubbing, and no one is actually enjoying themselves, and he's the one who is. And I I would be okay with that as the satire, right? The guy at the top gets to have all the fun, and everyone else has a hard time. Right. But Margarita also has a really good time. And the moment she enters into the entourage, well, I guess that kind of tracks moment she enters into the entourage, it's all fun. But this comes to the conversation I told you we were going to discuss at the end between Matthew Levi when he comes out and talks to Satan. He says, like, God of shadow. And he's like, why are you so against shadows? Right? That's things cast shadows. People cast shadows. And the only way to have light everywhere is to raise the earth to a, to a desert seascape, right? Where there's nothing to cast a shadow. Light needs shadow, right? To, to, have, a, to have a full world, you need the shadow, which seems like a weird thing to pop up in this book, especially if Woland is supposed to be the bad guy. And that's the same thing of with Woland being the one who like eventually grants peace to this couple. Like, yeah, he's not really punishing them. I understand that kind of the limbo place they go to in the afterlife isn't a super happy place, but it's not hell that he's sending them to. So Woland isn't doing some like horribly villainous thing at the very end. No, he doesn't seem evil. Seems like he's just having a fun time. So then he, does he see the regi- the Stalinist regime as like some kind of scourge or punishment on a really wicked people? Like is that the, is that what he's writing? That you get you know, these Russian, the, the, these dumb religious peasants had it coming? 
or these dumb peasants had it coming and Stalin is here and he's going to he's going to be both like the both the 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 jerk that makes everybody's lives miserable but in, he's also going to be the one that can dole out if not happiness some kind of sort of if not justice some kind of peace to the people that he favors I don't know well that maybe tracks but then why are the master and Margarita okay right they weren't stupid dumb peasants they were f- just well that's why because they're not stupid dumb peasants um, but but like they're regular people yeah. right he's a writer there's nothing special about her she was in fact kind of wealthy and just hated her life anyway yeah so there's nothing there's nothing that makes them worthy of having a good time or having fun except that he wrote a, a decent book right that's the only thing so i don't i don't know if that can be the message The Guardian says that in naming it after Master and Margarita, it's an optimistic ending, a hopeful ending. Does this strike you as a hopeful book? It's kind of a bummer ending, right? N- well, no. Master and Margarita come out unscathed. She sells her soul to the devil and ends up <laughs> finding peace. It's that romantic ending, right? Like that all you need in the face of like giant generational political upheaval is just someone to love, right? And that's the... And, and the devil to help you make it work out? Yeah, it, I guess if you need, you know, if, if, that, if he gets you there, then go for it. Then yes. Yeah. Um, so in that sense, it's like, yeah. So is it a book where, is that ending a concession? Do you think he wrote that as like an attempt to not get gulagged? <laughs> Man, I have, so I've been trying to put together what is the point, right? Mm-hmm. Why did Woland actually come to the play? He said he did it to, to meet the Russians, to meet the Moscow people. But is that enough of a mot- motivation? There's also this weird mirror between the storm that sort of rolls over Pontius Pilate and and Yeshua at the be- like kind of in the in the novel that the master wrote, and also the storm that sort of rolls in right at the end of the Master Margarita. It's a lot of the same okay. same so language. Then we got somebody, so then so then the death of Christ is somehow analogous to what's happening in Russia right now. That 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 seems to be that seems to track. Okay. So whatever, um, so Pontius Pilate killing Jesus, and maybe there's stuff in that, in the actual Pilate story that you said was in there that gives some clues as to the intention that why does Pilate say that Jesus needs to die? And so then the question is, um, what is analogous to what's happening in Russia and to the master? Like to that, the, the, I mean, so is it like, there's no more freedom of speech. There's no more freedom to be able to write your poet, your poetics. You know, um, the state is now coming in to like crush your voice. So is it that kind of? They would like, rather have a killer than a philosopher. Yeah. So is it that kind of? You know, the the state destroying the individual. Is that the critique? Just like how the Roman state killed Jesus, the Russian state is killing the artist, the Russian writer. Like, is that sort of the analogy that he's drawing? That's just from listening to. That seems to be what. I, I would go with that if it ended poorly for the Master Margarita, but it doesn't. It's a hopeful ending. But it doesn't end poorly for Jesus, right? Like, so his point is that, um, you know, somehow the Master in his persist the Master and Margarita in their persistence to, to, to love is the saving grace for them despite the storm and despite, you know, sort of the chaos of the regime. Okay. So all you got to do is fall in love and like follow you, you know your creative passions, even if it's going to go badly for you. I, I don't know. I, don't I, I mean, with yeah, but again, it's the regime that saves them. It is Woland that delivers peace, and Woland that brings. But under God's, but under under um, God's behest. Yeah. So is God in charge of the regime? Yeah. And the regime is the thing bringing you peace, yeah. even though it's the that, thing that's rolling over you. Yes. So that you've you've got this like. The regime is rolling over you, but it's also like beyond your understanding. So go with it. I don't know. Don't mm. know. That's that. I don't find it as a hopeful ending. I think it's, it's a massive bummer. What that they end having a peace together and in, in peace. Yeah, limbo, eternal, that's eternal not, peace. That's not fun. But it, they they that's talk about peace. it as if it's essentially heaven. He'll get to be hanging out with the ones he loves. She can never be driven away. She's like, I will, you know, watch, you know, sit and watch with you every night. Seems like a good deal for them. That's what. That's all they wanted. Nah. <laughs> It's not heaven. It's not heaven. Of course, Graham was going to disagree with that ending. Yeah. Yeah, and the 
I guess, well, is Moscow fine after the story also? Yeah, Moscow goes back to normal. They blame it on hypnotists and ventriloquists, and that's it. This doesn't seem like the biting satire of Stalin that I maybe was expecting. Which is why I'm, I'm so confused at the end of the book. I thought I knew what was coming, and it wasn't what came. Right, okay. Wolin didn't get in trouble. The chaos didn't last. They sort of visited the, that time passed, and Master and Margarita both got out relatively unscathed, even though they both died. So maybe this is what the writer, what's his name again? Bulgakov. Oh, maybe Bulgakov. Maybe this is what he thinks is going to be all of what this regime is, that it's kind of this flash in the pan, strong man coming in, re- messing things up, having a great time at the people's expense. Um, he doesn't know the horrors of post-war Russia right. and the yeah. gulags and all, and, the, and all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. So he maybe sees this as, you know, um, Stalin's more of a joke than Stalin's else. more of a joke and he just sort of bubbles up and he's and uh, this you know you've got this sort of atheist government that's coming and messing everybody up but eventually like it'll go back to where it'll everything will sort of settle down when people are like man what was that whole communist thing people are just be like ah it was just a bunch of tricksters a bunch of gamesmen ventriloquists and hypnotists and, Especially um, if he started writing it in 1928. That yeah, would have yeah. been so early on in Stalin's tenure that... But you don't have this. You just wouldn't know. Yeah, you just don't know. Where things were going to go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Um, and so maybe he just... Yeah, so maybe it's it's he sees what's happening as kind of this like blip in Russian history as opposed to the seismic shift that it was. Right. Um, and so then maybe he does see this blip in history as... God using the government to smack the Russian people for their, you know, degeneracy or whatever. Hmm. It's it's hard to it's hard to talk about it when you sort of when you had, just we, had a quick summary for well, me. Well, that, <laughs> but also you have the whole rest of the history of of the of Russia to know that you know this isn't just a blip. Like if somebody wrote right. A, wrote a story about Hitler and, and then died in 1940, right? And yeah. he was holding up Hitler as he has no idea of the concentration camps and, and, and the, re, the real extent of the horror. Um, uh, so it just sort of sounds like he has no real extent of like what actually he's dealing with with mm. Stalin, that to have Stalin be kind of this, uh, you know, motley fool um, is... Um, Kind of this, like almost this this Satan in the guise of of um, Faust. That's what it sounds. It sounds a lot like Faust. Oh, so okay, you're you're leading directly into my next section, which is why should you, as a listener, read this book? Yeah, but well, be, before we answer that, so um, he sort of has make, making sort of Stalin seem kind of like this Mephistopheles, foolish Faustian kind of devil, um, and who still and who's kind of like, not the handmaiden of God, but still is, like God can tell him what to do. Right. And, um, and he kind of does it. And so you've almost got the devil as being the, um, the scourge of humanity to kind of like goad us back into things. Kind of like how, f- how a fairies play a role in Shakespeare. Right, like the fairies' job is to kind of like remind humanity that we're kind of stupid. And so maybe he's sort of saying that... Um, this sort of silly regime that's kind of upheaval, turning everybody into fools is kind of reminding us that we're all kind of dumb. But he has no idea that what this is is uh, much more. A much more. It's much far. More the devil stays much longer than he had him <laughs> yeah. stay. I could believe that. All I, right. know, I don't know. So, I just wanted to sort of throw that out to to give some seeds for thought as you, the listener, go and goes and reads this book. And even though I've given you a big chunk of the plot, I have glossed over a whole ton of stuff that is still totally worth reading. And I recommend that if you do get this book, you get the annotated version. And I say that because it isn't just a fun little story about a devil's visit to Russia, right? What happens when the devil shows up in an atheistic regime? The, there is so much in here that is referenced material, and a ton of it is Faustian. Mm-hmm. Notice how I told you Woland had a green eye and a black eye. Well, one is for insanity, one is for like death or emptiness. Um, the poodle on his stick is referencing Faust, right? Because the devil first, or Mephistopheles first showed up as a poodle. It'll repeat itself several times. There are a ton of Faust references. The big crazy party with a bunch of naked people. Well, the big crazy party is essentially the Valpurgisnacht from from Faust. Faust. 
And then on top of that, it also references a party that an American diplomat had in Russia at one of his big houses. And it was said that a whole bunch of stuff happened, including a big bear that got drunk, which kind of happens in Master Margarita too. So he's it's sort of a double reference there. And on top of that, he references a whole bunch of other material like... We just talked about the Praslogion, the mm-hmm. ontological argument. Right. A couple of times, he doesn't outright reference it, but he uses language that is reminiscent. He says, the bread greater than which no other bread could be imagined or something sure. like that. And he'll just move on. Right. So I recommend this as sort of a companion piece. Once you're a little further down the, I guess you can do it like a like bookends, right? It's a great first read because it's really fun. You don't need to get all those references to understand it. It's just kind of a hoot and a holler with a walking cat and a guy with checkered pants and all kinds of crazy shenanigans. And then near the end of it, you have all of the extra meaning that comes with that strange ending and knowing a little bit more about Stalinist Russia and all of the references that are in there. There are a ton. And in my like barely annotated version, every reference was worth clicking on. So just get do yourself a favor, get an annotated copy and, and read with the annotations. It's, it is a good summer, like fun summer read. If you're Mm. looking for a pretty painless entry, (laughs) This is a painless the critique entry of into Stalinist Kansas. Russia. Beach time read. <laughs> I'm not. It really is though. This one's right. actually pretty fun. I I recommend it. I think this book was great. Um, yeah. So just th- thinking about that ending and um, with it being, it almost has that like everything is you know all will be well, all will be well kind of ending, without knowing all will not be well. That, that actually all is not going to be well in Russia right. for another chunk of years. Like it's it's this is the beginning of a pretty big. Um, dark period. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, uh, in the 1950s. Anyway, so it's just, yeah, just in terms of a artifact of history, to, re- to be reading something that is happening in the middle of a story that assumes an ending that doesn't happen. Right. <laughs> yeah. Is an interesting thought. Yeah. Just reading it, the language seemed really simplistic, and I didn't really see the depth of the tale until I got to the end, and I was like, okay. There's the whole thread with Master Margarita. There's also the thread of Pontius Pilate and yeah, how yeah. he kind of interacts yeah, with Yeah, how it. those stories superimpose sounds like Yeah, there's like three unexplored. layers, right? So mm-hmm. Pontius, Master Margarita, Woland and his and the satire. It's just it is a layered novel that I don't feel like I fully have my head around yet and is cool. Totally worth the read. I'm glad it was fun though. I think it was really fun. Yeah, I feel like I really didn't bring a whole lot of information to this podcast. Just more some questions, I guess. It's you good. Went, to, I mean, went through the plot, too, which was good. Yeah. Hey, I feel like we don't usually get very many comedies uh, in trying to look for uh, classical works. So yep. I this is one. That. Yeah, it's sure. funny. Awesome. Well, this has been Classical Stuff You Should Know, and you've all stopped your podcast right now. But for those of you who haven't, you can find us at the guys at classicalstuff.net. You can find us on the Twitters at classical stuff at CLSSCAL stuff. Um, we, yeah, classicalstuff.net is our website. You can patronize us on Patreon where we have in-between episodes, where we have AMAs, where we have all sorts of tidbits and sundries. Um, and we thank you for your patronage. Anything else, fellas? Nope. Cool. Well, this is Graham, AJ, and Thomas signing off. Okay. Bye. 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 Bye.